Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Chitra Babu from SSN College of Engineering. On behalf of uh, ACM India Chennai Professional Chapter and also on behalf of uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences, uh, I uh, would like to welcome all of you for this evening's talk on design your own app directly on your smartphone without any uh, previous knowledge uh, by uh, Professor Wolfgang Slaney. Uh, Wolfgang Slaney is the founder and president. Thank you. Yeah. Founder and president of the Catrobat non-profit free open source project in which more than 1,000 pro bono collaborators from around 100 countries are developing the Catrobat apps and services that allow users to create their own games, animations, and other apps directly on their phones. Through their main app, the users can download more than 30 million app projects created by other users. This Catrobat project has received many international prizes and awards, such as the Young Minds Award 2015 from the European Commission, two Lowy Awards in 2015 from the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences, London, UK, the Internet for Refugees Prize in 2016, as well as the Reimagine Education Gold Award for the Best European Educational Lab 2016, awarded by Wharton Business School, Best US MBA. And Wolfgang also heads the Institute of Software Technology at uh, Graz University of Technology in Austria, Europe, where he teaches an intensive introductory course on coding in order to increase the number of female computer science students, as well as giving students from all study fields the chance to learn coding in a fun and engaging way. Wolfgang is passionate about poverty alleviation through coding education for teens, in particular girls, refugees, and teens in developing countries directly on their personal mobile phones. Wolfgang's Catrobat non-profit free open source project since 2010 develops educational smartphone apps that work in a sustainable way also for teens in less privileged regions who do not have access to PCs and laptops by relying on the phones uh, which they already own and by bypassing the traditional school pedagogy, instead using the constructionist approach pioneered by Seymour Poppert and Alan Kay from the MIT Boston USA, focusing on the game app development and fun. Professionally, Wolfgang is consulting and teaching uh, on sustainable, large-scale, agile software development and user experience topics for mobile platform projects. Please welcome once again, uh, Professor Wolfgang. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you very much for the welcome and uh, warm welcome. So, yeah, the project that I'm presenting, Pocket Code, this is, a, is an app. Currently, it works on Android phones. We have an iOS version which is almost ready. Uh, and it's called Pocket Code. It's freely available. It's a non-profit project, as mentioned. So at a university, I'm uh, teaching how to manage such large teams. And here I have this real life experience of managing a team of more than 1,000 people working on it, developing the software, making the translation, providing educational materials, and so on. So it's really a challenge. Yeah, I can tell you it's a lot of challenge to manage that many people, but it works quite nicely. <laughs> So, um, pocket code, I hope you can see that. Is it possible to turn off this light here maybe also? Or, yeah? Because it makes it more difficult for me to see you. <laughs> yeah, so, much better, yeah? It's like in the movie theater. And I will show you a few things that are like in the movie theater. So let's start here. First, um, some examples of what can be done. So. Most of the pr projects are uh, something like this, yeah? uh, some uh, small programs where you have to solve some riddles like you know, move with the frog and then you have to catch the fly two times so that you have enough energy. A little bit slow here. Yeah. So I got it once now. There's a blue, second blue level here on top. And if I catch the fly again, then I have three energy levels, and then I may be able to cross the roads quickly enough. No, didn't work out, sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
So this is the kind of games that kids can create. And uh, thank you for mentioning it, but uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's like this. You can download now more than 30 million such projects created by kids through our app. Uh, one question here first. Uh, this work is based on the work of Seymour Papert, Alan Key, and so on. Do you, uh, who knows uh, the Scratch software from the MIT? Yes, a few people know it. So basically, Pocket Code is like the little sister project of Scratch. We are working together with the Scratch team. We are just now also collaborating on the new uh, Scratch 3.0 version where we take we take some of the code that they are using, we give back also um, all kind of stuff. There are lots of similarities and differences, but the one important point is here, if you go on, on the top right here, on the options, you will see there's a scratch converter beta here, and if you um, go into that, and it, it must be connected to the internet. It takes a little bit of time, but here basically you can search for any Scratch project. So if you have your own Scratch project uploaded already on Scratch, then you can just search for them here and they will appear at least when the internet connection is working. Yeah, it seems to be at the moment here, there, there, there seems to be a problem with the internet. But I'm showing you now one of the projects that were created with Scratch and which have been directly converted to pocket code. So this is a nice example. So it works using the loudness sensor from Scratch. And of course, we also have here loudness sensor. So if you, um, yeah, if you make some sound, it will turn and make. Oh, please, there are still enough seats in the front. Please just come to the. Yes. So it's directly linked to the level. And you, you know, you can just uh, use that as one of the many, many sensors. That's the important thing compared to developing on a PC, on a smartphone, you have so many sensors that you can use. Like, for instance, uh, I'll show you some few other examples. And by the way, is there, uh, is there also sound here that I can connect to the PC? Yeah, the, the audio cable. Yeah, this one. Is it possible? Is it long enough? Try to get that. Then I can. Wow, it's just a little bit short. Sorry, I, I want to add a little bit of sound effects. In the meantime, I can show you a few other things, like this, for instance. So, Oops. so here, this is one example. I'm sh always showing that when, when I do things with small kids because they like it so much. Yeah, they're very small kids, like two or three years old. This is just a finger painting program, but it works not only with one finger, but also with two or three or four up to 10 fingers. Yeah, this is also something that you typically cannot do with a PC because you simply don't have this touch sensitive. Uh, and the small kids love it, yeah, of course, because finger painting, that's what they really like. Yeah. Um, now let's see if the, the sound is working because I want to show you a few programs where sound is important. Um, for instance, here, yeah, this Frozen versus Star Wars. That's also one program that was created with Scratch and just translated to pocket code. But here, some kids really spend a lot of time making a very nice animation from the two movies, Frozen and Star Wars, a mixture where they fight with each other. So let's see if it works. 
sound. So it's just a very creative way to mix the two movies together. And if you look into the program, it's very complicated. It has all the elements that you need for programming, like broadcast, variable, loops, uh, conditionals, and such things. But it's all about fun. It's about you know to get motivated. And that's the crucial aspect. So now. It's frozen as one, <laughs> and they, yeah, they, then it continues forever in this forever loop. <laughs> it's just a very nice small example of a program that can be made. And let me show you here, for instance, inside how it looks like. So you have all those, you know, loops and and messages that are being sent. And I'm not even sure if it's the best way to do this program. Probably not, but I guess that the kids who did this had a lot of fun. By the way, you just saw now here NFC. That's one more thing. In the settings here, there are a huge number of things that can be controlled. Lego Mindstorms robots, uh, parrot drones. Last time I was here, I showed already the parrot drone. It was flying and making the video. Um, we have Arduino, we have Raspberry Pi, NFC, and the FIRO robots. These are the FIRO robots which are produced here in Chennai. Uh, this is one of the, uh, our partners here, and they are exporting this all over, over the world. They, the robots are interesting, also the Lego ro robots and the others, very interesting, because now with pocket code, you can put your phone on the robot, and suddenly the robot can get a face, a voice, but also computer vision and also voice recognition. And you can imagine the amount of programs that can be created if your robot has all those things, and also GPS, of course, and many other things. Suddenly it becomes much more interesting than what you can do without that. So just wanted to show you because the NFC was turned on from before. but. I'm not using that here now. Um, yeah, and also one more thing is here, you can change the language also. So there are many, many languages in which this is translated. Unfortunately, not yet into Tamil. I hope that I can find some volunteers who will join the project and help with the translation because we have Hindu, we have uh, Korean, Chinese, Arabic, Sindhi, and many, many other languages, but not Tamil yet. Yeah. It's a pity. Yeah, but it's not, if you use it, it's just in English, even if it's in the list. Yeah. So it's not yet translated. Um, yeah, let me show you how to make a new program, because that's also interesting. For those of you who know Scratch, it will look very familiar. For the others, let's say it's uh, the constructionist way, it's very inspired by Lego, Lego company and, um, uh, you know, the Lego Mindstorms, they're named after the book from Seymour Papert, Mindstorms, and that's all about creativity and pedagogy, and one thing is to make it easy to, to be discoverable, yeah, to, be, to, to find out what happens. So now I need a volunteer, maybe a young volunteer. Do you want to try? You, you are expert in Scratch, so it will be easy for you, okay? Come up. Thank you very much. Give him an applause, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, I want to do, uh, come to this side. Huh? I want you to help me program a compass. You know what a compass is? Yeah. Yes, you know what a compass is, good. So let's make a new one. Yeah, and we call it the compass. Oops, didn't. Yeah. Compass with the double S. So. Okay. so now we can decide whether portrait or landscape. Let's keep it like that. So we need a new object, which is a needle. Yes. So please, you can hold it in your hand. Uh, press on plus. Yeah. Now draw. Yes. Um, you don't even need line, you just do it like, oh, 
wait a moment. Yeah. Le, 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 I have to explain a few things. Yeah. So first, uh, you have to. In this case, you know, the thing is with Scratch, what is the standard direction from left to right, right? Yeah, 90 degrees. So you have to do it okay. in that way. Yeah? Okay. So, okay, let me do that for you and then you, you continue. So we call that the needle. Yeah. And here now, there are four categories. Categories, uh, three categories: the scripts, the looks, and the sounds. Looks okay. is what Look we have, questions. yeah. And scripts. So, yeah. for the compass, what do we need? We need uh, some movement, right? So even. Yeah. First, maybe some mo motion to point in the right direction. Uh, turn. Um, I would say, yeah, turn is also possible, but then you know you you have it turns always uh, a certain amount. Let, let me help you a little bit, okay, because, yeah. For the first time, you know, it's a little bit difficult, but he immediately, correctly identified which kind of bricks, like Lego bricks, are possible here. But, um, you know, we, we can try out things. Tinkering is always good, but turning left is only, um, is only it's always turning it in the same direction. Yeah? Okay, so you, so you'll need something else. Basically, it's pointing in a certain direction, okay? Oh, right, okay. Yes, yes. So then you need a variable. Just tap on it, yeah, put it here, yes. And instead of 90. Put a variable. Mm, yeah, there are some special things here which are okay. under the Ys, which are the sensors. Oh, okay. Yeah? Good. So you have Compost. like the loudness, yeah? Loudness, which sensor? Yeah, loudness, touches, acceleration, inclination, mm, compass, compass. and here is GPS. Yeah, so compass direction? Okay, press on compute. See? Yeah. That gives you the, the right number. And then you need a loop also to make it yeah. happen For all the time. Ever. Yes. Mm, control. Yes. Yes, tap, just tap. Yeah. Try. Nice, very good. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's it. <laughs> Great. So that's a compass. Easy, huh? Yeah, very easy. Very easy. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So here you saw now how easy it is. To, yeah, you see the program. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is the whole program. Uh, forever point in direction, compass direction. And here, of course, you can use many other um, things like we have all these, uh, like face detection, or if you use Arduino or Raspberry Pi, then it, some of the sensors can be connected here also, and then they will appear at the bottom as uh, pins from uh, analog or digital input from, from those external devices, and the same if you connect, for instance, the FIRO robot. I'll just show you that very quickly. Uh, sorry, going back to the main menu. Um, yeah, you can bring me one, but I will, I, I will first show it here in the, in the settings just. I will turn on, in the settings, the FIRO. And now, here, when I press on plus here to add some, I have some special category for fire bricks. And there you see, there are the motion bricks for the motors. Uh, you can play some music. You can also set the light of the LEDs in the front. And if you press here, you can change the colors in such way. These are just R RGB LEDs, like you see here at the beginning. So you can change the colors and everything. So I'll not program it now because uh, we need to set up the Bluetooth and everything that, that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, something for, for another, afterwards we can show it, yeah? So delete this break, yeah. So that's the way you can program here. And the idea is the following, you have, like, like uh, you just try, uh, showed us how to do that, yeah? You have this box of bricks where you can 
Of course, you have to learn it once, yeah, but it's very logically or organized. Everything that is related to motion is here in this motion category. And here, now, for those of you who know Scratch, there's something new and very interesting, which is we have, we have a physics engine, which is very useful for, for games. Yeah? So it makes it much easier to program all the games where you have need physical simulations. Yeah? So how does it work? You have here a new brick, which is called set motion type bouncing with gravity. Um, I will just uh, disable this for a moment and also make it a little bit smaller. So I change the size, set it to 60. So what happens now if I do that is that this will fall down faster and fast, faster and faster, and then it falls down below. Yeah. So if I don't want that, you know, there's this um, small brick. You know it, right? Uh, which is if on edge bounce. Yeah? So if I put that into the loop here and I delete this one, I don't need it anymore. So now it's not really a compass anymore. What happens is it just bounces from the wall. Um, it knows exactly how, how it should uh, move because of the, uh, of the physics and it automatically cuts out whatever you draw. Yeah? So it's not a bouncing box or anything. It really on the fly computes the contour of this, of this arrow or whatever else you want to use. Now let's say I want to move that around depending on the inclination. Yeah? So what would I do? Again, it has something to do with motion and there's here the possibility to change the gravity vector. Yeah? So it will, here of course, you will need some, some inclination vector. You can check out the value that it gives depending on the movement of the phone. And then because the resolution of the phone is very high, you need to multiply that by some larger number like, like 10 or something. But then, you know, it's like this. As, as normally from left to right is the positive x direction, right? And moving it up like this is also positive. So if, uh, you know, if I don't multiply it by minus 10, then it will move like a, it's, a, it's also possible. Let's do that, yeah, why not? But then I will have to do it here as well for the y y inclination and now what happens is looks like this it depends on which way i'm you know turning that and it will just always float up you see like like the arrow is made of helium so like this and in that way it's really easy to make games for instance i will show you one other game that has been created with that which is um, this maze here, tilt maze. Yeah? So here I have to balance the phone in such a way that this metal ball is navigated through the whole labyrinth. And you see it's kind of a little bit difficult. So um, question here again, anyone wants to volunteer to try that out? I know. In the afternoon, I did it with kids, and there were many volunteers. <laughs> you, it's already late also today. So I'll just demonstrate it. But if, if anyone wants to try out something, please don't hesitate. And also, uh, ask me any time, any question. Yeah, I'm, very, I'm very eager to explain everything, but it's, it's always, you know, if I start talking, I will talk for three days about this project, because it has so many different aspects. Yeah. So uh, yeah, one, uh, because one of the reasons why I wanted to have some volunteer actually is because this vibrates whenever it touches the, the walls. Yeah? So each time it bounces from the wall, you, you feel a small vibration in the phone, like it's very realistic actually. Yeah? And this movement here for the ball, you just declare the ball as a, as a physical object that bounces under gravity and that's it. You don't need to program anything special. So it makes it really easy to, to develop such games that involve somehow yeah, the, the physics. So 
now there are some new things that have recently come up. One of them is that it's possible to use the phone also as an input device in the sense like, um, who knows the Nintendo Wii? You know Nintendo Wii? Yeah, there are some few people. Okay, not so many. Uh, anyway, that, that was a groundbreaking game uh, station where you can play using the remote control, so to say, but by moving it around. There are many sports games and so on. And the same thing can be done here with a phone. So I'll show you this uh, with a, one example. And I will, um, it works like this. It's a, it's a bouncing program. You just hold your phone like this, hold it toward the screen, and then there's a ball falling down and you can control it, you see, with with just moving around your, your, your phone, you can, you know, let it move. And again, it uses the physics engine to control the movement of the ball. So this is a really a 2D uh, physics engine that allows to, to, that simplifies the programming of such games enormously. And why do we want to make it simple? Well, you could also program it yourself, right? Uh, nobody hinders anyone to, to program the physics by him or herself. Uh, that's, that's clearly something that is always possible. But computing the contours of complex objects is not trivial. Uh, that makes it very hard to, to program such um, games. So it's a kind of simplification because um, what, what I'm interested in is motivation. I want to motivate the kids to become interested in this whole topic. Just three names. Yeah? Uh, recently, I saw that uh, Elon Musk from Tesla, he started programming when he was 11. He did his first uh, asteroid kind of shooter game and even sold it to his friends. And that's how he started. And later, he created PayPal and now Tesla company and SpaceX. So it's really, you know, where do you start? Same also with Bill Gates. His first program was tic-tac-toe. Yeah, we have it here also. So now I need a volunteer. Ram? Please. <laughs> so here we have uh, this tic-tac-toe implemented. And the fun thing is also that it's possible to export that as a real Android app. And then you can play it, you know, like uh, really. Gossip Girl? Yeah, later. We can do that. Uh, let me see, where is my... Where is uh, Tic-Tac-Toe? Oh, here. So... <clears throat> you just hold it in your hand. Yeah. So that was the first... Yeah, yeah. You, you can also tap, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So this was uh, how Bill Gates got yeah. motivated and got his introduction to computer science and uh, how he became, now I think he's the second richest person in the world, sometimes the uh, richest one. And I also heard that Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, he became interested in programming because his elder sisters didn't have time to play with him. They were busy with their studies, so he decided to write his own first computer games. Now, I mentioned already, I'm, I mean, it was mentioned also in the announcement, I'm very interested in especially uh, motivating girls to start programming because the number of girls in computer science is, especially in, the, in, in Europe, is very low. What do you think is the percentage? You know, there's this computer Olympiad, international one. What do you think is the percentage boys versus female, uh, female versus male participation among teenagers in high school in Austria? Nine to one? It's 99 to one. Yeah? It's terrible. Yeah? And I think there's no real reason because it's not so difficult and it's interesting. Everyone is using those devices, and there's no really, really good reason. Yeah? 
And I also saw that uh, in the newspaper here in the hotel, there was this uh, entrance exam from IIT, I think, uh, that announced. Yeah? If you look at the images, only boys. Huh? Even in, in India here, it's, I think the IIT students, only 9% are females. Huh? It's very low. And there's, it's, a, it's a pity because at school, the girls are often much better than the boys. Yeah? So why don't they? follow up. Yeah? So we try to encourage that also and uh, Robotics Edu, uh, the company here, they're also doing lots of uh, workshops with girls, girls coding clubs and such things, also not only in Chennai but also in the surrounding areas. So I think that there are lots of initiatives but it must be something that works by itself. So one of the things that we are doing now is that we, it's, it's a little bit, let's say, um, Controversial, yeah, because what we are doing is we. I always explain it in such a way. Catrobat, I mean, we are not a company; it's just a non-profit, uh, free open source project. But we are a little bit like a car company, like the company I don't know, Ford or Volkswagen, Audi, and so on. Yeah? We don't have just one car. We offer different models, yeah? and we also different. We offer different models of our apps. We have a second app which is called Create at School, which is uh, particularly well suited for teachers because it allows them to give accounts for students. We have another one which is Fire Code, which is specialized on these robots. So the robots are already turned on, the example programs are included for the robots and so on. And now we have a new version which will come up which we call Luna and Cat. And we don't say that it's for girls, but the whole look and feel and everything is clearly meant to be uh, so that it can be easily found and found to be attractive by girls in the App Store. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, most of our users don't come through schools or such places, they come directly through the App Store. So if they find us, and install us and then try it out, then it works. Yeah? But they have to find us. And I was at some workshops organized by Google where they explained about you know, small differences in the icons of apps, like to make it a little bit cuter and suddenly you have 20% more downloads. Yeah, it's crazy. So it's all about this self-selection. Which car do you like? Do you like the family sedan or do you like the you know, sports car and so on? So it's, about choice. Yeah? It's the same with clothes. Not everyone likes pink uh, <laughs> jeans. Yeah? So there's a, some self-selection. But then it's more. It's not just about the design. It's also about the kind of programs that you will see. The reason is, I mentioned already, we have those 30 million projects, but we also have an app store here, which is under Explore. And I hope that the internet will work well enough. Then I can show you this. This is a full scale, like the Scratch website, where, where you can download the programs others have uploaded. And uh, you can you know, like, uh, check it out. Like There's the tic-tac-toe, which is kind of popular because it's already a long time in, in, the, in our market. And if you go on that, then you will see you can, <coughs> you will be able to download it itself, of course. Takes a little bit of time, sorry. So here you see all kind of statistics about it. And one in interesting thing is, okay, here you can download it as a program uh, for into pocket code. Here you can sh see how people remixed it, how they changed it, how they enhanced it, and the whole uh, links between all those programs and it's a real graph nowadays it's not a tree anymore because you have complex uh, things because programs can be merged together from several so that kids can work together in small teams so you can have several programs getting mixed so it's a kind of directed acyclic graph yeah so no it has like yeah it's it's complex it's a graph yeah? and then the last point here you can also pro, uh, download the app as a real Android app, which you can then sell or you can you know, enrich with advertisement or whatever, because we want to give kids also the chance to earn money with these programs. Some of these programs that I will show you later, maybe they have 100 million downloads. 
very simple program. So it's all about what you imagine in the brain. I don't have to tell you this, but computer science is really fantastic. You don't need a manufacturing plant, you don't need sales, you don't need a, a shipping company or anything. You just need your phone, a one-time investment with Google Play. You pay, in Europe, we pay 25 euro, which is very low. Yeah? It's like, uh, I don't know, a few coffees. Yeah? It's not nothing. But then you can upload for as many years as you want without any annual fees as many apps as you want, forever. Yeah? And this is really something. So here, show you one example of a program that we have compiled into such a demo app, which is signed. But this is version two. Yeah? The important point at the bottom here is the ad. Yeah? So this is not our ad. This is the ad from the student. Yeah? So they will get the money. They will need probably some permission from the parents to earn money. But that's, I mean, that's also something that we really want to encourage. Yeah, to, and our licenses are all in such a way that this is possible. So going back here, you see the, the downloads, and then there are similar programs and so on. But the important point is all those recommended programs and most viewed, most down, new, newest programs and so on, for the special version, the different version, not pocket code, but the, uh, Fire code and uh, Luna and Cat and so they will always show first all those programs made by others who have the same app, which makes sense because those who have, for instance, this robot, they want to see other programs made with this robot. And there are not so many people doing do this, so uh, it will get. Since the screen is very small, it's important to show them relevant programs, and the same will happen with this Luna and Cat, and hopefully. This will be especially interesting for girls, and then the girls will see the, the, the projects that other girls have made. Because we made lots of studies, and it's amazing, but especially for teenagers, this is like day and night what they are interested in. Yeah? The boys make programs about, um, well, we have users from all over the world. I'm, I'm not, I don't know exactly what the Indian kids do, but I know, for instance, our biggest community is in Russia. And the Russian boys, they're all fascinated with weapons. Yeah? So they make all the programs about shooting and firearms and whatever. Yeah? And the girls never make such programs. They have no interest from them in this area. Yeah? Also, we have many girls from Russia, but they don't make these <laughs> programs. Yeah? The, the programs uh, they make are more in this, uh, this direction. Like I show you some pro typical programs that girls, oops, sorry. Not the compass. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Frozen versus Star Wars probably was made by by a girl, but uh, one typical example here is this Marion game or um, Gossip Girl. Yeah, that's a typical program that was made, I think, by some fan of this American. <laughs> TV series. So, yeah. This continues forever like this, yeah? So it's a really fan video animation, but it contains many of the elements that are needed to, to program, yeah? so, so it's just standard scripts that are used to make all this animation. So it doesn't matter whether boys make programs about weapons or girls make uh, some animations or some interactive things. There are some overlapping things, but, uh, uh, topics, but you see there is a big difference. So we, if, the, if the number of boys is so predominant, then they will push away the girls, and we don't want to have that. We want to encourage them. We want to include them. So, um, yeah. Oh, there, there was uh, one, uh, one thing also that I wanted to mention is uh, we, some of the things we, we added, and we thought they're useful for certain things, like, for instance, face detection, face localization, we added. Uh, we thought that's very interesting with the robots, because then the the robot can see if there's someone in front of the robot and turn to that person. 
But of course, the kids had totally different ideas. They made totally different games with this. Yeah? One here is this Hypno Medusa. It's a game where we have to hypnotize animals, and it should it needs some light so that it can recognize my face. But you see, whenever it sees my face, the eyes of the animals will turn. When I put my hand in front of the camera, it will stop. Yeah? So it, I must look all the time at these animals and hypnotize them. But sometimes a monster, a medusa, is appearing. And I don't know when this will happen. Yeah? And as soon as it happens, I have to throw away my phone. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, I'll lose. Yeah? So, now it can continue, yeah? so I didn't lose. So it, but if I don't do that, or if I look away too long, then I will lose. So you can imagine this is the kind of ideas, creative ideas that kids get just by you know, taking advantage of all those built-in things where we never got the idea that it would be possible to do such things. Yeah? So this is um, kind of nice. And now, because we saw that, we also started to create some, uh, have some new ideas. Uh, there, there's this, you know, the, uh, from, uh, from Microsoft, the Xbox, it had for some time this sensor about body movement, Kinect, it's called Kinect. Yeah? So here we have also the camera included, and it's possible to make this kind of, of small uh, games, like where I can kind of move around my head to bounce the ball. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult, but especially when I hold it myself. But this is interesting. If you have a smart TV at home, with a smart TV you can connect the screen of your phone to the TV. You can put that in front of your TV and you can play games in and you can create those games yourselves. Yeah? One question that always comes, and we have this question as well, is, is it possible to make multiplayer games with this? Of course, yeah. it would be very nice to have that. And we have a working prototype, which works with Bluetooth, so you can connect several phones together to, to play together. And that, yeah, it's perfect for parties, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so this, this is some of the things that we are working on. Yeah? We have so many things that we are working on and it's like you know sl uh, going slowly but we get also some support now we have support every year from google at the moment there's one student in jaipur who is working with me together and he's paid by google uh, i think uh, five or six thousand uh, dollars just to work in our project it's called the uh, google summer of code program which is open to students all over the world and we have been selected by Google already I think seven times as a mentoring organization so yeah it's one of the few mentoring mentoring organizations and the students they got a lot of uh, goodies like t-shirts but also they're they are paid and then there are some prices also additionally and there's a new thing that's more for the parents or the younger kids. There's something called Google Code In, which is always in December and January. And there, there are only very few projects. Like, we are one of 10 projects, I think, who are um, cooperating with Google. We don't get any money, but the students also, in that case, don't get any money. But the, the students who win, they are invited together with their parents to California by Google. And just now, uh, in June, one, uh, one kid from uh, Sri Lanka and one from UK will go to, and they were selected by our project yeah? because they worked last, uh, last, last winter on our, our, on our tasks. So if you have kids, they, they need to be teenagers from, I think, from 13 to 17. And you can tell them about this. It's a really fascinating opportunity for them to get involved. We are also working with other companies like Robotics Edu here, and also Samsung and a few others. Yeah, so it's all over the world. Um, but there's not much money involved. Yeah? It's mainly done by volunteers, as I said. I think. 99% of the work that is done is done by volunteers. And a few are paid. So uh, for instance, the, the student in Jaipur with whom I'm working now, he is working on 
um, on adding a way to have the scripts that, uh, that you can see in the programs, uh, to have those scripts. Um, oh, maybe this doesn't work now. Let me see. Yeah, um, I have here, I have installed a new version and yeah, it's, uh, it's incompatible. But if I go to, uh, to, the, to the scripts here, you, can, you will be able to make a pinch gesture and then the scripts will all look like in Scratch, you know, in a 2D version. Because we have here this 1D version, everything, you know, just linear. But if, if his project is finished, then we'll be able to move that around more freely in a more um, e easy way. But of course, the screens are small, so that's one of the reasons why we keep that in such a way, kept it until now in such a way. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. So, for instance, this don't touch the white tiles. That is such a program. If you look it up in, in, uh, in the App Store, you'll find this program has more, more than 100 million downloads. Yeah? It's really amazing. And it's easy to program than it just, just in a weekend. Yeah? It's not complicated, but you know, even us professors can, <laughs> can do it <laughs> as a side <laughs> job, so to say, <laughs> to become rich or whatever. Yeah? But it's not only about becoming rich or having an economical future. In my opinion, it's really important uh, to understand how those things work, because everyone's work uh, is based on this nowadays. It, it transgresses all the industries. Everyone needs IT and needs to understand it. We all the get, I, I guess everyone gets a lot of spam and phishing mails every day. And you know that the, the people who don't know how all this works, they're more uh, prone to be taken advantage of. Yeah? So this is also important to understand how things work. And then there's this uh, concept of so-called computational thinking. It's a very interesting concept about how to think in a more creative way, in a kind of lateral thinking way, when you know about algorithms. So uh, the thing is, there, there have been some inventions by people outside of the field of IT, which were only possible because they had some knowledge about IT about this procedural thinking, about the computational thinking. One of the best examples, in my opinion, is the invention of the PCR, polymerase chain reaction methodology, because it, it allowed to find a way to, to detect um, genetic uh, um, strains very, uh, in very low concentration and to blow their concentration up through exponential means by a method that is inspired by computer science, by algorithms. Yeah? So really fascinating. So uh, yeah, I think I told you a lot of things. So please, let's, let's open the discussion if you are interested in anything. I, I want yeah, to answer your questions. <laughs> and please, don't worry. Ask me critical questions. It's fine and welcome, yes. Oh, oh. Want children to grow in a very natural way. Look at the sky, look at the butterfly, play in the garden, fight with the sisters and brothers. And uh, whatever you have, your efforts, very commendable efforts, seems to develop some kind of skills, which to me, you know, in a very, maybe it's a loud thinking, not a correct comment, takes you far away from good human relations. And Nature, uh, for playing example, outside. <laughs> the teenagers, yeah. I mean, you, you will say that they are not playing war games, but they are creating war games, the Russian teenagers. But eventually they will be playing. And also you said that, you know, the games at home, playing with the smart TV and so on. I would rather like my grandchildren to play outside with other kids. So the emphasis seems to be on 
something you know that doesn't relate to human relations and mm -hmm. so please comment on that. yes yeah that's Sorry for it. no that's very welcome you know i'm also a father i also want my kids to play outside with their friends yeah that's very natural that's that's normal yeah we want this but we have to face reality reality is that the kids play with the phones they have the phones and um, in my opinion yeah that's a problem maybe yeah. it's a problem it's really a problem uh, and I'm I'm also very worried about this trend that uh, kids get younger and younger to get the phones yeah so some uh, in 2012 I made a presentation with scratch in uh, the south uh, in some school in the south of, of my city in the in the you know countryside and those were fourth graders so it's like uh, 10 10 years old and in this class in 2012 i asked who has a phone they all had a phone yeah and i think that's too early nowadays even the the six year olds get already a phone yeah? and that's not a good trend i don't like this at all it's very problematic, I think, because it has open internet and you know what, what happens. Yeah? So uh, I don't want to you know, encourage that in any way. And our program is also, uh, we say it's for teenagers. Yeah? So it starts at 13. And that's an age where it already, you know, they can be a little bit more self-disciplined uh, and so on. Now, what they do with their time, yeah, that's, a, that's a difficult thing to say. I just want to give them the option to do something creative instead of being just a consumer of the technology. But I agree with you, there must be a balance in life. Yeah? There must be something with friends, something with nature. Creativity, yes. 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 Down to, with this yeah, but you know, on, on Sunday, I went out here, we had a course on, I, I attended a course on column, you know, the column, yes. and, yeah, and it was interesting, this is a specialist about columns, She's a, she was in a newspaper in Japan, all about the column, she showed me this, and then, I showed her what we can do with, with this, and she was so interested, so we started coding together a column program. So can, where can, she can draw on the screen and do the very nicely exact mathematical drawings, and she was totally fascinated by this, huh? here in Chennai, two days ago. So, you know, it all depends what, we shouldn't limit ourselves, huh? but I want to give those kids a chance to participate not only as a consumer, but also as an active person in this field. And it will become more important. Uh, it's, it will not become less important. So as a, as a grandfather and father, I totally agree, yeah, but <laughs> we have to, it's like in computer science, I'm teaching also software engineering. Yeah? And of course it's good to have documentation, but nobody likes to do the documentation. Yeah? So it's a little bit the same thing. Yeah? So we need to face reality. <laughs> That's, yeah? Please. It's nice to be able to develop on your phone, but wouldn't it be even better if you had an option to do it on a PC platform? For example, there are cross-platform development tools like Xamarin and Embarcadero. So maybe if you think of a package like that, uh, people might be able to use PC for development and then you know simulate it on a virtual device and then move it across to that platform. Do you have any such plans? Yeah, so the, uh, the question is whether we want to encourage also to, do, to use that on a PC. And the answer is on PC you have already so many solutions. Yeah? But there are not many on, on smartphones. And the thing is we do this for kids and they have the smartphone in their pocket all the time. Many of them don't have a PC. We do this for kids in Africa, in South America, everywhere. They all have nowadays, the teenagers all have smartphones. Mm -hmm. Very few of them have PCs. So if we want to give access to many kids to these technologies, we have to do it 
We have to introduce them through the means they already have. There was this one laptop per child project from the MIT, which tried to distribute very cheap $100 uh, dollar laptops all over the world. And they did this with immense investments and United Nations and UNESCO and everyone participated. But all together, all together over the, I think, 10 years, more than 10 years was this pro project, they distributed 2.9 million such laptops, which is nothing yeah. Yeah, compared to the 700 million teenagers worldwide. It's nothing. Yeah. And it didn't have much impact, and it was so much effort. So what we try here to do is zero cost. The kids have already the smartphones. And then if they become more interested, they can always move up to a PC if they have one. Yeah. But here we want to give them the opportunity to do the whole thing from zero to up to selling their own software without the need for a PC. And it works. You can do many really complex programs. Actually, you can do much more complex projects than on a PC. Um, during Christmas holidays, I made a Sudoku solver with this. Yeah? And it's not a normal, like you would normally as a human solve the, the Sudoku. It works in parallel with 120 processes working, scripts working in parallel, attacking the problem from all different sides, solving it very quickly. But it's not important that this can be done. The important thing is how, if you can start thinking in such a way that you can solve, that you can give a computer instructions how to solve Sudoku in such a way. Yeah? So actually this whole parallelism is much works much better in, in Scratch and also in Pocket Code than, for instance, in JavaScript. In JavaScript, there's no parallelism. So you would have to you know, develop that in your own way. So okay. actually, you say that what you did worked on an Android? Yeah, it works on the on Pocket Code. Oh, with so many processors? Yes, of course. Yeah. It's uh, threads, yeah? so it's multi-threading. Thread. Yeah. 120 threads in parallel mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah? So. Mm -hmm. You can now also, you are talking about the iOS version. Yes. Okay, so now if somebody uh, developed a program on the iOS, uh, is that also uh, transportable? Exactly. This? Exactly. So there is no need to change the code. There is no difference. Uh, the okay. kids don't know whether it's iOS or Android. It's just the same. Uh, uh -oh. It's 100% compatible. That's yeah. why we are still fighting, because the sensors are behaving a little bit different in the yeah. iOS version. And now yeah, we got some funding from Google, not Apple, but Google, yeah. to help us with the iOS version as well. They have less problems with competition. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Oh, the, maybe first the boy huh? the, okay. behind you. Right. Yeah. So to make multiplayer games, like, oh, like are there like variables and other lists are Yes. Something you can use for multiplayer games? At the moment, not yet, but we have a working prototype where the global variables can be shared. Yeah? So you can say, uh, if we link two, two phones, then in, while the program is running, they will have access to the same variable and can you know, read and write, and then you can do any kind of multiplayer game. When so will it come? I, yeah, it will come. Hopefully next year, yeah. Because I'm also waiting for it. I want to make programs with multiplayer. It's so much more interesting. But thank you for the question. Yeah? So don't worry. When you're a little bit older, you'll be able to take advantage of it. It's a long-term project. Yeah? This is, since it's not dependent on funding, it's very convenient. Yeah? It's very different from a company where you always have to think when, where to get money from and so on. So this is kind of yeah, free project. and. Even in 10 years, we'll still work, be working on it. We started in 2010, so it's already running for some time. Uh, don't worry. I want it too. It's very high on top of our list, but not at the most top, unfortunately, only the second level. Yeah. There are other things we have to do first. So thank you. Uh, just wanted to ask if there is any security-related problems in this uh, development, or somebody can, you know, Yes. Uh, make a, a sound recording and uh, re camera recording with this thing which is not desired. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much. Good, Very good question. And the answer is yes, there are so many security concerns. It's terrible. 
it's terrifying because it's uh, with children and we invade the phones and you can imagine we, we, uh, we encourage that kids compile apps that then other kids download and install sideload on their phones, yeah, which is always a security concern and it's open source. And if, you're, you know, if you know about security, you know that introducing malware into open source code has been done several times in the past and it's almost undetectable. Yeah? Because it's just a few lines, it maybe it weakens some security, uh, it's very difficult to detect. I have been at some conferences in the US from the Free Software Foundation and Electronic Frontier Foundation. They, they showed how to introduce a small, tiny, tiny thing into a program and suddenly there's a backdoor and it can be controlled from outside to do almost anything. So this is a concern and there's no easy solution. And there are many other things. We have been attacked. We are constantly, like everyone, under attack. But in our case, we have, uh, we even had already Interpol coming to the offices and, uh, you know, downloading everything from the servers because there were some very problematic uploads. So we have had everything already. Just saying, we are doing our best, but there is no easy solution nowadays about all those things. We, for instance, detecting malware. How do you do that? Yeah, if there is a malicious contributor to open source code, and we have thousands of people contributing, how do you detect whether this introduces a weakness in some encryption algorithm or such things? Yeah. And also, we had a problem with phishing because. Now we solved that, but we didn't know at the beginning uh, there were, you know, when, when kids upload their program, there's the nickname written there. And many kids used their Google Mail account as a nickname, so the full Google address, not many, but let, let's say a few percent. And then they used also their Google password instead of creating a new one. And then there was someone who send them emails that they had to change the password for pocket code, which was not true. It was not from us, but someone took advantage and collected like that probably emails, yeah? and not emails, but uh, passwords, Google passwords from those young users. Yeah? So yeah, there, there are thousands of things. We stopped that now in such a way that we don't allow email addresses as accounts anymore. Yeah? But it's also only a small thing. Yeah? Yeah? You permit uploads of these uh, uh, apps onto your uh, yes. pocket code. So if that is so the case, why can't you control as to what is getting uploaded? You can push through those apps, some kind of uh, security check and only approve, then only put it. One of the problems, of course, you see the Play Store is more open than an iOS app. iTunes, I think they have more of a regulation. I think you literally you'd find that it would be less of uh, No, iOS also could have... Uh, issues. But I think Google Play Store is more open. Everybody is uploading it. So similarly here again, why don't you have your own checks and balances when these apps are getting loaded into your uh, pocket code? Yeah, we have some checks. We have some checks about keywords and such things, but it's impossible to do that in all languages. In all languages, that's yeah. a problem maybe. And then many things are not in text, they are in pictures or even in sounds or even mm. as hidden, in, uh, hidden information somehow that they you know, bypassed our security because all, all our security is uh, disclosed on, in our source code. So it's always easy for the others to find weaknesses in it. Uh, so, so we have those problems, yeah, but that's something ongoing. Yeah? Like every, everything, everything on the world, we have to fight against this cyber security yeah, problems. Um, good evening, Professor. My name is Aravindan. I work with a non-profit called Teach for India. We okay. directly serve um, around 3,000 children in Chennai. So my question is related to this. Um, I'm seeing this as an I mean, amazing technology of building computational th thinking among kids. So when you see like more than 40% of the population in India, which is around 400 million, are below the age of 18. So I'm seeing a large scope of scalability of the project. So just want to know about what are your thoughts related to, like how to take this to more and more people. So yeah, yeah your thoughts on that. So thank you very much for this 
I, I want to talk to you later. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, the scaling is like this. Uh, we found that most we can reach most of our users uh, through the app stores and through YouTube. We tried also Facebook, but has no effect. Eh? We, we even invested money into Facebook to see whether you know advertisement works. There was a lot of likes, there was a lot of discussion, no impact. Eh? But YouTube works, and not our own YouTube videos, but the YouTube videos that our users make. Kids, many kids make YouTube videos about how to use pocket code or what kind of programs they made, and those get huge amount of views, and that's something that works. Eh? And then other users find us through them or through the App Store. So with the App Store, at the moment, we are only represented with a few apps there, but we want to make more popular apps because kids look for apps. And when they find us, they install this, and that's one of the good ways. If there are any other ways, you know, like I, I'm giving talks here, and one of the take-home messages here, now please, everyone wake up, yeah? Thank you. The take-home message is, all of you know some teenagers around you, yeah? Show them pocket code, okay? Show them pocket code. You don't have to teach them because they will learn it much quicker than you probably, <laughs> but just show it to them, tell them about it because it's so difficult to reach them, yeah? I don't know, what, what is your experience? I, I work also a lot through schools, but schools only go so far, it's very expensive, you have to contact them and the teachers are reluctant and they don't want to do that. <laughs> it's very hard for schools. We yeah, so from my experience, I was a teacher for two years and I had this opportunity to work with this Google Scratch project. So it's like made compulsory for all the children, so like from the government. So like similar to that, if we have some initiatives, it will be like really amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, how scalable is your architecture in terms of here, from here? Oh, yeah. Uh, how scalable is your architecture, overall architecture, and in specific to the database intensity? Because particularly in a country like India, where it, if the adoption is as expected, mm -hmm. uh, then we'll have serious, serious problems in terms of load balancing and concurrent users will be too high. Yes. Uh, how, how have you devised it or what are your plans in that? And how scalable is it, it, it is? And in terms of even you know inserting more algorithms to the apps. So uh, the question is about the scaling up and how does it um, work with our services. So the thing is, this is really a problem. This is a huge problem, uh, and we are constantly thinking about it. And we ha we face troubles at the moment because our server infrastructure. We we are running around uh, I think 25 servers for all this, and uh, the servers are overloaded at the moment. So I just uh, bought a bunch of new, very expensive, high power service, servers for this from my some grant money that I got. So I, I just spent like, I think altogether um, around 30,000 euro on the service. Yeah? But the thing is, this is n never sufficient. Yeah? It's, it's not going to scale up, and we are facing troubles because of this all the time. Scratch, the Scratch project from the MIT had the same problem. Uh, because they, uh, some years ago, they became responsible, I think, for 5% of the whole traffic of the MIT. And MIT has a lot of traffic because they have these online courses, videos, and everything. So 5% was just Scratch. And they got a grant from Amazon, I think, and now all the resources are in the Amazon cloud. So this is, but it came also quite late for, for Google, uh, for, for, sorry, for, for Scratch, and probably we will need also something like that that can scale up. Eh? But we are also thinking about other things, like for instance, the compilation currently is done when kids compile their own pro programs into apps. This is done on our server. And that's very intensive. So if we manage to push that into the smartphones of the kids, then we can take away the, the load from the servers and push them to the clients. And another one is the translation of Scratch projects. That's also currently done on our servers. But we should also push that to the phones. So that it, because it's not so intensive, so the phones can handle it. But it's impossible to handle if there are millions on one server 
going on all the time conversions. So, so there, there are some plans to do that, but it's a, a definite <laughs> concern and <laughs> on, ongoing struggle <laughs> to handle. But we have some plans how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, are there any more questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, you can always interact with him during the tea and snacks. Yeah, uh, give him a big hand. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, on behalf of the ACM Chennai chapter, I would like to invite uh, our chair Rajesh Kumar to hand over this memento to Professor Wolfgang. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.